Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We've got a few people waiting to connect, um, so I'll just uh, allow them to do so. But thanks very much for joining us for this session. Um, this is a book launch event, uh, event for um, Professor Abraham Anderson's excellent new book on Kant and Hume and the principle of sufficient reason. Uh, thanks very much for joining us all. Um, I'm just going to uh, just give a brief kind of introduction to our speakers. So uh, but my name is Patrick Hassan, by the way. I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at AUC. So, so Brom is a colleague of mine, I'm happy to say. Um, I work on 19th century philosophy and ethics. Um, I'm going to be giving some some brief comments um, on uh, 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 Brom's book as well. But uh, we're also uh, delighted to be uh, to have with us um, Professor Michael De La Roca from Yale. He's also going to be giving us some comments on um, on um, uh, Brom's new book. Um, he's amongst a host of other publications, the author of uh, uh, books on Spinoza for Rutledge. Um, also the editor of the Oxford Handbook of Spinoza as well, and has written prolifically on the principle of sufficient reason. So we're very happy to have him join us. Um, Brom's book uh, on the principle of sufficient reason in Kant and Hume um, is with, out with Oxford University Press now, so you're able to pick that up. Um, and if you didn't get the email with the discount code that I sent out, please just drop me a message. I'm happy to send that out to you. Um, how we're going to run is that we want to make this quite informal and make sure everyone gets the opportunity to speak if they'd like. So first of all, Brom's just going to give an overview of the main arguments um, and some of what, what's going on in the book. Uh, there'll then be comments from Professor Michael De La Roca, and then I'll have some brief comments of my own about uh, the principle of sufficient reason in, in Schopenhauer and drawing some parallels with what Brom's saying in the book. So um, I do apologize as well if I drop in and out because my connection's a little bit iffy today. But um, without further ado, please let me introduce um, Professor Abraham Anderson, who goes by Brom, and uh, he'll give an overview of the book, and then we can dive straight into the, the fun comments and, and criticisms. Okay, so Brom, over to you, please. First, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, I, I took Michael's suggestion, and I got in touch with uh, a lot of people who have been uh, interested in, in my work over the years, and I, I uh, those people are often very good friends. And in some cases I reached well beyond people who are actually in philosophy departments. So I'm very glad so many of you were able to make it. Um, and I also wanted to say that the book is, is dedicated to the memory of Andanes Tani, who was a very close friend who helped me get started on this project in the year 2000. Okay, um, I'm just gonna read a couple of pages to you. In the preface to the Prolegomena, Kant says that it was the objection of David Hume that first, many years ago, interrupted his dogmatic slumber. <clears throat> it was suggested by Weihinger that Hume interrupted Kant's dogmatic slumber by challenging the principle that every event has a cause, to which Kant, which Kant claims to demonstrate in the second analogy. And this view has remained widespread. In Kant, Hume, and the interruption of dogmatic slumber, I propose another view. Hume woke Kant, I suggest, by attacking the rationalist causal principle, which is not restricted to experience, like every event has a cause, but extends to things in general. Uh, this principle was, and Leibniz states this principle, and, and Volz states it as, uh, there is nothing without a reason why it is thus and not otherwise, but there are other ways of putting it. This principle was used by Descartes, Locke, and Clark, but also by the Leibnizians and Wolfians to prove the existence of God. Leibniz and Wolf call it the principle of sufficient reason. It is by challenging that sort of proof that Hume roused Kant from dogmatic slumber. This makes sense because Kant means by dogmatism, in part, a claim to know things in themselves, and in particular, things beyond experience or things which could be known only by pure concepts. And Kant's reference to the objection of David Hume is preceded by a description of Hume's attack on metaphysics. Hume woke Kant not by challenging the causal principle governing experience, but by attacking metaphysics, in particular, the knowledge of God and spirits. My claim that Hume woke Kant 
by attacking the principle of sufficient reason, and that his attack persuaded Kant may seem strange because Kant often uses the expression principle of sufficient reason to refer to the causal principle governing experience, which Kant, of course, accepts. It may also seem strange because Hume never refers directly to the principle of sufficient reason. Rather, Hume in the inquiry rejects the principle ex nihilo nihil fit, which the ancients, he says, used to exclude the creation of matter. I argue, however, that the principle Hume is actually rejecting is the causal principle which Descartes, Locke, and Clark used to prove the existence of God. Wolf and Baumgarten treat ex nihilo nihil fit as equivalent to their principle of sufficient reason, which they too use to prove the existence of God. At Prolegomena section 30, Kant tells us that his demonstration of the causal principle forms part of his solution to the problem of David Hume. This has led many to suppose that Hume's problem was a doubt of the principle that every event has a cause, and that Hume woke Kant by challenging him to prove this principle. However, Hume never doubted this principle itself. What he doubted was the possibility of knowing it through pure reason. And far from rejecting Hume's argument that we cannot know the causal principle through pure reason, Kant spoke of it as an incontrovertible demonstration. This demonstration woke Kant from dogmatism because only if we could know it through pure reason could we use it to know objects beyond experience. And the claim to such knowledge is what Kant means by dogmatism. Kant proves the causal principle governing experience not to refute Hume's demonstration that we cannot know the causal principle through pure reason, since Kant agreed with that demonstration, but to show that the concept of cause has an origin in reason. This allows us to use it for thinking causes beyond experience, like God, though we cannot know them. The distinction between what we can know and what we can only think is crucial to Kant's awakening from dogmatism. It lets him deny knowledge, that is, reject dogmatism, in order to make room for faith. In a late letter to Garva, Kant says that it was the antinomy that woke him from dogmatic slumber, and this has led to attempts to reconcile this assertion with his declaration that Hume roused him. I would propose that we can only reconcile these two declarations by seeing that Hume roused Kant by challenging the dogmatic use of the principle of sufficient reason, for it is that use which is challenged by the antinomy. The aim of the antinomy is to enforce the lesson which Kant learned from Hume, that we cannot use the principle of sufficient reason to know things in themselves. And that's it. It's not 15 minutes. It's shorter. This means it's your turn, Michael. Okay, so I, I um, will go. Um, thank you, Brown, for that introduction. And uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. It's really uh, great to be here to discuss Brown's book. It's a, it's a wonderful book. I've read it a couple of times already. And um, I just want to say a few bits about it. And in the, uh, in the spirit of what is called for on such an occasion, I will offer one or two uh, gentle uh, challenges to Brahm toward the end of my comments. And then we'll see, we'll hope we'll have a good discussion. So Brahm's book is a wonderful tour de force that puts in an entirely new light Kant's famous, enigmatic, strange, and almost always misinterpreted revelation in the prolegomena, the revelation that I, he's, Kant says, I freely confess it was the objection of David Hume that first, many years ago, interrupted my dogmatic slumber. It's a great line by Kant. Now, as Brahm argues, not only does the correct understanding of Hume, of Kant, and of their relation turn on the correct interpretation of this enigmatic claim in Kant, but also at stake here is nothing less than the fate of the principle of sufficient reason, the PSR. The fate of the PSR is at stake here. And 
Um, and also the fate of metaphysics in general. For me, the drama of this book is irresistible. I see philosophy and the world through the lens of the PSR and any work like Brahms that displays the PSR's hidden or not so hidden impact on philosophy and the world is welcome to me. But it is not only a PSR aficionado like myself that will find Brahms work captivating. His book is at once a scholarly masterful original work on Kant and equally a scholarly masterful and original work on Hume. Moreover, it is a work that in, engages with a wide range of recent and prominent and older secondary literature on the vital topic of the role of the PSR in Kant's engagement with Hume. Let me explore briefly some of the things which I've learned the most from in Brahm's book. And Brahm touched on some of these things in his summary a few moments ago. Brahm distinguishes between what he sometimes calls the unrestricted PSR or the rationalist PSR or perhaps the dogmatic PSR on the one hand and a PSR restricted to experience on the other hand. A restricted PSR of this type is what I have elsewhere called a tamed version of the PSR, tamed version of the PSR. For Kant, the restricted or tamed PSR is limited to things that we may experience. And this tamed PSR says in effect that within our experience, every event has a cause. Brahm sometimes expresses this restricted PSR as simply the claim that every event has a cause. Now, this unrestricted version of the PSR is dogmatic. It makes a claim about things in themselves. And it says that each thing in itself must have an, an explanation. And further, that any series of dependent beings must have an explanation. The unrestricted version of the PSR, the untamed PSR, was employed by Spinoza, Leibniz, and Clark, and many others in their attempts to engage in philosophical or metaphysical or rational theology and to prove through reason alone such claims as that God exists. Now, the question that guides Brahm is this. When Kant says famously in the prolegomena that it was the objection of David Hume that interrupted his dogmatic slumber. What human objection is it exactly that Kant has in mind? Is it the human objection to the restricted or tamed PSR according to which every event within our experience has a cause? Or was it Hume's objection to the unrestricted, untamed PSR and so to the version of the PSR used in rational theology? Brahm convincingly claims and argues that many commentators believe that it was Hume's objection to the principle that every event has a cause that interrupted Kant's slumber, to Hume's objection to the restricted version of the PSR. On this reading, Kant awoke and came to see how he could defend the claim that every event has a cause and defend the restricted PSR by, among other things, developing transcendental idealism and developing the argument used in the second analogy. On this interpretation, Kant and Hume are thoroughgoing antagonists and Kant regards Hume as simply an opponent. Hume denied that every event has a cause and Kant affirmed this claim and that's that. Now, the problem with this reading, according to Brahm, is that Hume did not object to the claim restricted to experience that every event has a cause. For Brahm, Hume indeed embraced this claim. And Hume also held that we have a posteriori knowledge of this claim and of the claim that there are necessary connections between events. Thus, Brahm says, I'm going to give a couple of quotes now from Brahm's book. Brahm says, not only did Hume never attack the principle that every event has a cause, but Kant never supposed that Hume had done so. Brahm also says, in rejecting the principle ex nihilo nihil fit, from nothing, nothing comes, Hume is not rejecting the principle that every event has a cause, which he emphatically accepts. Brahm goes on to say, I do not think that Hume holds that 
any event can exist without any other. Rather, Brahm says, Hume only denies that we can know causal necessity a priori. He seems, on the other hand, to endorse the view that we can know it a posteriori, insofar at least as Hume defends the doctrine of necessity in section eight of the inquiry. Now, if this reading of Hume is correct, then if Kant, in making his claim about being awakened, saw Hume as rejecting the claim that every event has a cause, then Kant was simply and badly wrong in his reading of Hume. In part for this reason, Brahm thinks that we should go against the tide of almost all readings of Kant and see the human objection that, that, that roused Kant as Hume's objection to an unrestricted, untamed, dogmatic, metaphysical PSR. And because this untamed PSR support, supports rational theology, the objection of David Hume then is for Brahm as much an objection to rational theology as it is to the unrestricted PSR. Now, if we see as Brahm does the interplay between Hume and Kant in this way, that Hume and Kant emerge as to a significant, significant extent allies and not opponents. As Brahm puts it, Kant is a devoted heir to Hume who sees his own work as simply as Kant himself puts it, the execution of Hume's problem in its widest possible elaboration. For Brahm, Kant, no less than Hume, sought to discredit rational theology and to do so by discrediting an unrestricted PSR. Further, Hume and Kant on this reading agree that every event has a cause. Now, of course, Hume and Kant still disagree on much, according to Brahm, particularly on the issue of whether there is some kind of a priori basis for the claim that every event has a cause. And relatedly, they disagree on the status of mathematical knowledge and on the ontological status of space and time. So these are real differences between Kant and Hume still on Brahm's view. But Brahm's Kant, who was awakened by Hume, is a Kant much more significantly in agreement with Hume than is usually recognized. So that's a, uh, Brahm brings Kant and Hume together in a, in a nice way. That's a good thing to see. One of the many benefits of Brahm's reading of the dogmatic slumber claim is that it provides a neat resolution of a seemingly bad potential conflict within Kant. In addition to the claim that Brahm noted this earlier at the beginning, in addition to the claim in the prolegomena in 1783 that, that it was Hume who awoke Kant from his dogmatic slumber, Kant also says in 1798 in a letter to Garva that it was, quote, the antinomy of pure reason that awakened Hume from his dogmatic slumber. On the standard reading of Hume, this mention, uh, on the standard reading uh, of the mention of the prolegomena of Hume, uh, the mention of Kant's mention of Hume in the prolegomena, a reading according to which Hume's objection concerned the restricted claim that every event has a cause, there is no good way to reconcile that claim in the prolegomena with the claim in the letter to Garva that it was the antinomy of pure reason that awoke Kant from his dogmatic slumber. And that's because there is no clear bridge between the antinomy of pure reason and the denial of the claim that every event has a cause. However, if the relevant objection of David Hume is his objection to the unrestricted PSR and to rational theology in general, then we can very well see, thanks to Brahm, how Kant could say both that the objection of David Hume and the antinomy of pure reason roused him from his dogmatic slumber. And this is because it is the unrestricted PSR and rational theology that are, to a large extent, responsible for the antinomy of pure reason. This is a really, I think, important result of Brahm's book. Now, Brahm carries out the entire investigation in his book with verve and clarity. And it does my rationalist heart good to see the PSR rightly taking center stage in the encounter between Hume and Kant, an encounter that Brahm brings to life in a vibrant way. Let me close though with 
um, a potential challenge to one aspect of Brahm's reading. Again, I completely agree with Brahm that it is best to see Kant as being awakened by Hume's challenge to an unrestricted PSR and by Hume's concomitant challenge to rational theology. And I am, I am in complete agreement with Brahm's claim that Hume's challenge to the PSR is at work in the inquiry to which, unlike the treatise perhaps, Hume had access. I'm mean, sorry, to, to which Kant had access. However, Brahm also goes out of his way, I think, to say that Hume agrees with Kant on the restricted PSR, the claim that every event that we can experience has a cause. However, I don't quite see why we should regard Hume as embracing the claim that every event has a cause, and indeed, as, as Brahm claims, embracing the claim that we can know a posteriori that there are necessary connections in the world. As we saw, at work behind Brahms' interpretation is his willingness to endorse a reading of Hume according to which, although we don't have a priori and, and demonstrative knowledge of causal laws and, have necessary, and of necessary connections between events, we can and do acquire such knowledge empirically. Such a reading is in keeping with what has been called a causal realist reading of Hume, or what has been called by Ken Winkler, who is, I think, here today. He may be, I saw him earlier on my screen. Uh, what's, what's been called by Ken Winkler, the new Hume. Brahm seems to endorse this kind of reading, this causal realist new Hume style of reading of, of Hume. Now, I have doubts, however, as to whether it is right to see Hume as embracing the claim that every event has a cause and as accepting the causal realist claim that there are necessary connections in the world. Hume's claims about necessity are tricky, of course, but he does tell us how to understand those claims and to understand them in a reductive fashion as turning on mere constant conjunction. This is one upshot, as Ken Winkler has stressed, of Hume's footnote concerning power in the second part of section four of the inquiry. Further, Hume embraces the separability principle according to which there are no necessary connections among distinct existences. And although this, although this principle is explicit only in the treatise, as Brahm stresses, and it's not explicit in the same way in the inquiry, I think nonetheless it is at work in the inquiry where Hume famously says in section seven of the inquiry that all events seem entirely loose and separate. But apart from this question about Brahms' reading, stemming from the role of the separability principle in Hume, we can also ask a further question about Brahms' reading. On what basis would Hume be entitled on Hume's own terms to affirm the a posteriori necessity of the claim that every event has a cause? If, as Brahms thinks, it seems, uh, that claim of necessity is is more than a mere claim of constant conjunction, then it's hard to see how Hume, the Hume of either the treatise or the inquiry could be entitled to this claim. In any event, I don't think that we need to see Hume as affirming that every event has a cause or as affirming a causal realist view in order to embrace the key aspect of Brahms' revolutionary interpretation of Kant and of Hume Namely, the aspect according to which it was Hume's attack on the unrestricted PSR and on rational theology that was the wake-up call for Kant. That, I think, is a really a very valuable uh, aspect of, of Brahms interpretation, and I completely agree with it. So I'll end my comments there and turn it over back over to Brahm. Thank you so much, Michael. But I think Patrick is going to speak now. Oh, sorry. That, pa Patrick. That's all right. I'll just, I mean, my, my comments, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, my comments are just going to be quite cursory, and I, I'm happy to say we'll echo, I think, some of what uh, both Brahma and, and Michael have been saying as well. And then Brahma will be able to, to pick up and respond on, on which things uh, he thinks is most appropriate. Um, and I should say, just once again, for people who came in late, I do apologize if I suddenly drop out or my connection is a, is a little bit uh, dubious today. Uh, hopefully, it'll be okay. But um, Yes, I, just, I wanted to pick up on some of what was said because um, 
I'm just going to be making some remarks about the principle of sufficient reason as it was received after Kant, uh, in particular by Arthur Schopenhauer, and some of the ways in which how Schopenhauer views the relation between Hume and Kant on this issue actually quite nicely complements uh, some of the, the themes that Brahm is, is uh, entertaining in the book. And I should say at the beginning that um, um, you know, I learned quite a you know a significant a lot from from Brom's book, uh, both about Hume and Kant. Uh, the exegetical finesse uh, is impressive, um, and I found the arguments to be generally persuasive. Um, although maybe I will say something at the end about um, actually some maybe agreeing with Michael on on how to interpret Hume, but um, generally I found myself very sympathetic to these claims. So I just want to talk a little bit about. Uh, how Schopenhauer might be interesting uh, as a, just a kind of perspective on what's going on in the book. Um, and we've had some nice overviews of what's, what's going on so far, so I won't have to dwell on that. Um, so just to give you a kind of very quick introduction and overview to um, Schopenhauer's uh, um, attention to the principle of sufficient reason. So Schopenhauer credits Kant. He sees himself as a Kantian, right? He credits Kant with collapsing, or what he sees as the collapse of dogmatism uh, that he sees in rationalism and scholasticism. Um, and what Schopenhauer sees himself as doing is trying to defend Kant's crucial insights, his, his reigning in of the principle of sufficient reason um, against what he sees as the unfortunate um, tendency of the German idealists to try and sneak back in uh, a kind of theology through the back door um, going back to the unrestricted use of the principle of sufficient reason. And, and here he has in mind, of course, Fichte, Schelling, and of, you know, most famously and most unrelentingly in his criticisms uh, against Hegel. Um, so Schopenhauer's attention to the principle of sufficient reason um, actually forms the basis of his 1813 uh, dissertation, which I'm sure many are familiar with, the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason. And what he's trying to do is to examine what many different philosophers have recognized as, as an innate tendency to assume that in principle the universe is a thoroughly uh, understandable understandable and intelligible place that we can understand it through and through um, and the most as we've heard some of the most prominent kind of proponents of this view are people like Spinoza, Leibniz, Wolf and so forth. Um, now although the principle of sufficient reason um, for Schopenhauer, and I think also for Kant, might seem to be something that is self-evident, seem to be something we can just kind of make use of as a, as a kind of linchpin principle in our conceptual apparatus. Schopenhauer was very keen to question the universal extension of this principle, just as Kant was. And, it, and this is where he thinks that his contemporaries, like Fichte and Schelling and Hegel, are going wrong in that they're kind of betraying this in, you know, extremely important Kantian insight um, about how to restrict the PSR and which he finds interesting parallels of uh, in, in various traditions of Indian philosophy as well. So Schopenhauer accepts the, um, the argument from the synthetic a priori to, for, for transcendental idealism amongst some of his own kind of more um, idiosyncratic arguments uh, for this position. And the contraction of the PSR is supposed to follow as a result of this. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about what he's saying in this dissertation. So the general idea is that the, uh, the general root of the principle of sufficient reason as we use it is the distinction between subject and object. And that has to be presupposed, right, for us for the, as a condition for the enterprise of looking for any explanation whatsoever, okay. Then he tries to say that there is actually, there's a fourfold distinction of different kinds of necessary connection between things in the world. You've got material things, this is reasoning in terms of cause and effect, abstract content, uh, concepts, this is reasoning in terms of logic, mathematical and geometrical constructions, this is with reference to the numbers in space, and then what he calls kind of psychologically motivating forces. So this is moral reasoning, right? And Schopenhauer thinks there's a great problem going on when we mix these different kinds of explanations together and we, we switch from one kind of reasoning to another and equivocate between these four different routes. Uh, this is exactly what he thinks is going wrong in, in many forms of theological reasoning, specifically the ontological and cosmological arguments. And it's, he sees it as his task to try and prevent this from happening, or at least expose this, this very common tendency in philosophy to do so. 
So we can't intermix these different forms. Now, what I really want to get to and what I want to talk about with respect to Bomb's book is that for Schopenhauer, um, there is a, a very explicit tendency to interpret the what's going on right, with the, the attack on the principle of sufficient reason in both human camps. There's, there's this tendency to, to look at it from this anti-theological perspective, an anti-theological aim, which Brom brings out quite nicely in his book as the kind of background motivation for a lot of what's going on with these thinkers. Um, and there are affinities here, which are very, very interesting. So as Michael was, was, was very uh, clearly explaining here, um, Brom sees this kind of interplay between Hume and Kant, um, which positions them really not as opponents, but as allies. And this pushes against the pre-prominent interpretation of this, this famous sentence, that Hume's awakening Kant from his dogmatic slumber. So as Brom puts it, and I just want to draw attention to this quote that, that Michael's already raised, he says, a devoted heir to Hume, who, uh, this is, uh, uh, a devoted heir to Hume who sees his own work as simply the execution of Hume's problem in its widest possible elaboration. Now, this is where I think there's actually a lot of common ground between what Brom's doing. I think what Schopenhauer is doing in the um, appendix of his uh, magnum opus, uh, De Welt as, as uh, Wille und Vorstellung, right? This is, this is his tremendous work of his, he sees as his, um, magnum opus, in the, the appendix to that, with the critique of the critique of the Kantian philosophy, we get some pretty interesting parallels. So this is where Schopenhauer explicitly wants to say, well, to defend Kant, but also to point out his, his problems. He sees the connection between Hume and I think in a very similar way to Brahm. He says, Kant's philosophy corrects and makes use of Hume. And he goes on to make this anti-theological aim, right? Very, very explicit. This is a longer quote I want to read out to you. He says, we can note further that just as Kant was admittedly, uh, admittedly brought to his doctrine of the a priori nature of the concept of causality by Hume's skepticism in reference to that concept, so Kant's critique of all speculative theology might have been inspired by Hume's critique of all popular theology, a critique that Hume had set out in his Natural History of Religion, which is well worth reading, and the di dialogues on natural religion. Kant might actually have wanted to supplement these, right? This is, in, again, the, the critique to Kantian philosophy. Again, we can see other parts of, of Schopenhauer's critique, which actually lends itself to this view of human Kant as allies in this respect. So on the teleological argument, for example, Schopenhauer says, but even here we find David Hume to be Kant's worthy forerunner in the recognition of this truth. He had sharply contested this assumption too in the second section of his dialogues concerning natural religion. The diff and this is the important point, the difference between the Humean and the Kantian critiques of this assumption is mainly this, that Hume criticizes it as based in experience, while Kant, on the other hand, criticizes it a priori. Both are correct and their presentations complement each other. So here I think we've got a pretty interesting parallel in the, in the way in which Hume and Kant are supposed to be um, interpreted and, and, the, and the causal link between them. What, what precisely was the influence um, uh, which led Kant to uh, be awakened from his um, dogmatic slumber. So again, I think what's going on is that Schopenhauer tends to interpret both thinkers in a way that I think Brom wants to agree as attacking the principle of sufficient reason in this restricted form, uh, sorry, sorry, in the unrestricted form, uh, and not this kind of causal principle governing experience that every event has a cause. So far as we're interpreting that as just governing experience. And it's only when we apply this beyond experience, namely that the strong conception of the PSR, which was supposed to be known by reason alone, is what's being attacked by, by both thinkers. So I think that um, Brom might actually be revealed as a kind of Schopenhauerian in this respect, right, in his critique of Kant, right, which is interesting. Um, just a cursory comment on the interpretation of Hume, and then I'll pass it back to, to Brom, and then we'll open the floor to the rest of you guys. Um, I was also struck by the, the interpretation of um, Hume, or at least the seeing interpretation of Hume as a kind of causal realist that he is quite happy to say that every event has a cause uh, just on a posteriori grounds that this is justified. Um, and I wonder if, if we're not uh, sympathetic to that reading of Hume, and I think there, there might be good reasons to push back against that, as Michael was saying, um, could we, or might Brom, this is a question for Brom, might we um, 
interpret Hume as some have done. I think kind of Peter Kale has an interpretation like this, if I'm not mistaken, interpreting Hume about causation and necessary connection as a kind of projectivist, that it, he's a kind of anti-realist about necessary connections. But in some sense, we, we have our minds project this uh, understanding of, of connection uh, between objects in the world of experience. I wonder if we might be able to accept that kind of interpretation while not really giving up much of uh, what you want to say, Brahm, in the book. So I, I kind of similar have, have similar worries that Michael had about the realist interpretation of Hume, although I do agree that it doesn't undermine, undermine many of the other uh, important insights that you, you, you give, and mainly the, the important one about Kant and Hume being, in a sense, allies, and this anti-theological tendency, this, this ability to, be, to make philosophy more humble in a respect, um, I think we can retain that, you know, regardless of this interpretation of, of, of uh, human causation. Um, and that, yes, I think that what I've tried to kind of suggest anyway is that I think there's some quite interesting resources in Schopenhauer's critique of Kant, which you might find affinities with from, um, and, uh, and perhaps even further substantiate your claim, which, as again, I found very useful myself in trying to think about these issues. So perhaps I'll leave it there. I don't want to go on for too long, and I'll just pass back to you, Brom, and just feel free to pick up on anything that either I've said or, or, or Michael's uh, uh, points as well. But uh, yeah, thank you again for, for the opportunity for having us to read this and back over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick and Michael, both. Um, I'm just gonna start with Patrick's remarks uh, because I've got Michael's in writing. So Patrick, one of the things you said that really interested me, but I sort of missed what you were referring to because I was thinking about the previous thing you'd said. You were talking about uh, Schopenhauer, having said that Hume doubted on empirical grounds, same principle as Kant doubted on a priori grounds. And what was the principle? Was it the causal principle? Was it, what was it? So this is when um, Schopenhauer is referring to the, the uh, um, teleological argument. So he's talking mm. about how um, even there he thinks the PSR is at play in some form. Um, and it's this which Hume doubts uh, uh, on, on uh, uh, is trying to critique uh, from an empirical perspective, and, and Kant is also trying, in a sense, trying to do the same thing, but with with different um, from a different perspective. Uh, would you like me to read that out again, just to? Sorry. Would you like me to read out that quote again, just to? No, I get it. Thank you. That makes perfect sense. Now that now that I'm not distracted by the previous fascinating thing you said, uh, I've got it. So. Um, I'm very grateful to you, Patrick. I think, um, you know, I'd read the the Fourfold Root and I'd read the first volume of uh, World is Will and Idea, but I'd never read the Critique of the Kantian Philosophy. And I guess I really do have to read it. And I'm I'm very grateful to you for pointing me to it because I think, I think you're right. I think I am on the same page as Schopenhauer on a lot of things. Um, but, uh, all right, now, I, I let me go back then to Michael's remarks, um, and uh, one of the questions that Michael asks. I mean, I'm really grateful to Michael for his generous appreciation. Of course, uh, this is extremely gratifying. And I, I, I remember once I got Michael in, to come to speak at Sarah Lawrence a few years ago, and uh, when I introduced him, I said, "Well, if Michael didn't exist, I would have had to invent him," which is an extremely egocentric way of putting things. But the point is that it's such a blessing for me to have met someone in the real world who is a true protagonist of the PSR. It's all very well for me to refer to Pierre Bale or, or people like that from the past, but who knew that it was still possible? And it turns out it is, and as Michael will point out, it has always been and will always be. But uh, so- Thank Thank you for inventing me, Brahm. <laughs> I, I, the, sorry for my presumptuousness, Michael. I just mean it's a way of expressing my gratitude for you. But, uh, but uh, I, I think that you exceed me and I not you. But anyway, one of Michael's questions is, he says, uh, if as Brahm seems to think that claim of necessity is more than a mere claim of constant conjunction, he's talking about Hume on the principle that every event has a cause then it's hard to see how the Hume of either the treatise or the inquiry could be entitled to it. And 
I mean, it's an excellent question. I mean, Hume does most, uh, probably most visibly in paragraph 13 of, of, of section eight of the inquiry, affirm or the, 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 this principle that every event has a cause when he says that philosophers through experience, you know, that, that ordinary people think that when a, when a watch runs down or stops working, it's, it's chance. But philosophers through experience have learned that when there are contrary events, they're always to be explained by contrary causes. And he says similar things when he talks about uh, miracles, you know, uh, when he's talking about the, the eight days of darkness that he imagines happening, he says, well, uh, the correct response to an event like this is to go find the causes, <laughs> you know? So now, but that doesn't quite touch the question of whether he or the philosophers he's speaking of are entitled to this principle. But I think, I think there is a kind of implicit response to that in Hume, although it's only implicit. And that response is contained precisely in his argument about what's usually called his argument about induction, in which he says that all knowledge of matters of fact rests on relations of cause and effect, and all, all knowledge of relations of cause and effect rests on experience. But that if you ask, well, what basis do we have for supposing that uh, that the future will be like the past, because without that, uh, we can have no empirical judgments. He says, well, there is, no, there is no basis in demonstration, and it would be circular to argue that there's a basis in experience, because that's exactly what we're talking about. What's the basis of empirical judgment? Now, one way to read this is that what Hume is implicitly saying is that, that uh, the principle of the uniformity of nature which is closely related to the causal principle is a condition of the possibility of experience. So you could say that um, in that sense, Kant's defense of the causal principle governing experience is already implicit in the latter part of section four of the inquiry. And I think there are also hints in that direction in section 10 on miracles especially at the beginning and the end. Um, and maybe that's not surprising because the problem of whether every event has a cause gets its real, I think it's real meaning in the early modern period and maybe all the way back to antiquity uh, from the problem of miracles. Because I remember hearing Strawson in Munich uh, uh, talking about, talking about uh, skepticism in, in, in Hume and I've, I've, you know, he was talking, his idea was that, well, nobody really, this is, this is just something for the study. Nobody really doubts that every event has a cause, that sort of thing. And my response, which I don't think he made much of was, what about miracles? <laughs> it's not, uh, anyway. So that, that's my answer to that part of Michael's question, but um, anyway, then uh, I think we, let me just read what I wrote. I think we do have strong evidence that Kant thought Hume didn't doubt every event has a cause. Um, for example, when he describes Hume's question as, he says, Hume's question was not whether the concept of cause is correct, usable, and indispensable for the whole knowledge of nature, for this Hume never doubted. That he says in the preface to the prolegomena. Now, he doesn't strictly say that Hume never doubted the causal principle, but I think, I think you can read what he's saying there, given, given the context as, as implying that. Um, on the other hand, Kant also says from this, a little bit earlier, from this he concluded that the concept of cause is nothing but a bastard of the imagination produced by habit and foisted on reason as her own child. Um, and I think, I mean, Ken will back me up here. The, the scholarship, Hume himself said in a letter to Stuart, uh, as well as in his letter from a gentleman, that he, he never doubted that, you know, the causal principle. All he doubts is that it's grounded in reason. Um, now, maybe he's being insincere. That's worth considering. But uh, 
uh, I think it's also worth taking the poss taking seriously the possibility that he means exactly what he says. Um, but uh, let's see. So what I my last remark was um, that Kant's, Kant's assertion that Hume regarded the concept of cause as nothing but a bastard imagination. Uh, there's certainly we certainly don't. Uh, need to read Kant as having a causal realist understanding of Hume, according to which there are real hidden connections. Um, precisely in part because of this statement that, that uh, Hume thought that the concept of cause is nothing but a bastard of the imagination. Because if we have no real necessary, no idea of real necessary connection, it's kind of hard to assert positively that there is such connection. On the other hand, you could imagine a causal realist sort of reading, uh, which admits that we have no idea of necessary connection except constant conjunction, as Hume very emphatically says, but also no grounds for denying that there is such necessary connection. And that precisely because we are not entitled to the principle of sufficient reason which says that there's nothing without a reason why it is thus and not otherwise. Because in that case, we have no basis for denying necessity just because we can't grasp it a priori or conceive it. And I think this is, in a way, Kant's essential conclusion about modality. But that's a huge subject. Um, finally, I think Kant sees Hume as divided between his empiricism, which Kant resists, and his skepticism, which Kant regards as pointing the way towards transcendental idealism uh, and approves of, although he sometimes speaks of Hume as a skeptic when he's thinking of Hume's dogmatic empiricism, so it's a bit confusing. Uh, nor, I think, does he think that Hume has seen all the consequences of his own objection. But one of the things that I did in the book was to talk about, there's a, a, a among Hume scholars, a very controversial section in Hume's writings, which is uh, part nine of Hume's dialogues, of which the classic discussion is by Ken Winkler. Um, and because in that, in that, uh, who's here with us tonight, uh, in that part of the dialogues, um, Cleanthes tries to turn the tables on, on Samuel Clark's demonstration of the existence of God uh, by saying that, well, Clark, because Clark had said that we can know that matter is contingent because we can think it's non-existence without contradiction. Uh, and he used that in order to prove that, that, uh, that there must be a necessary being that supports the existence of matter. Um, and Cleanthes turns this around and says, well, but if we suppose that there is some necessity in the nature of God, which, uh, which makes his existence necessary, well, why couldn't we say exactly the same th that we don't conceive? Why couldn't we say exactly the same thing about matter? Um, and in so doing, I mean, Cleanthes has previously said, well, we can't conceive necessity. You know, he said what Hume says several times in the inquiry and in the, and in the uh, treatise. But then he makes this argument retorting against, against uh, Clark. Um, He's taking advantage of the fact that Clark himself had acknowledged that we don't really understand how God's nature, why, why God's nature necessitates his existence, although we, we can understand that, it, that, that God's existence is necessary. Um, anyway, uh, I can't solve that problem now. Um, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. Ken has written brilliantly about it. I tried, to, I tried to argue in the other direction, but it's also, as you say, Michael, it's not really it's, it's, it's a bit of a side issue for my book, although I think it has an interesting relation to it because I think it is connected with the question of what transcendental idealism is and means. And I think there might be a real relation to, uh, to this weird reading of Dialogues 9 that, I, that I'd like to, to propose. So maybe I'll stop there and turn things back to Patrick to moderate us. Yes, excellent. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for those those comments. Um, I'd really just like to open it up to people now and uh, get a kind of free flowing conversation going. 
So if anyone has any comments or questions, uh, please, if you just use the raise hand function, if you can do that just by clicking on reactions at the bottom of the screen and then raising your hand. Um, uh, Bridger, yes, please, do you want to go, do you want to go first? Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I really enjoyed reading the book. Uh, I, I had a question that, that follows up on, on Michael's comments. Uh, so in the book, you cite the doctrine of necessity of inquiry eight and treatise 231 as evidence for Hume's having accepted the causal principle restricted to experience. And I was a bit unsure about this. So that's because the doctrine of necessity uh, as described by Hume doesn't seem to me to entail the causal principle. Uh, according to Hume's doctrine of necessity, a cause necessitates its effect. But from the fact that a cause necessitates its effect, it doesn't seem to follow that everything has a cause. And so I'm wondering if you could explain why you take inquiry eight and treatise 231 to support the reading on which everything has a cause within the realm of experience for Hume. Well, thank you, Bridger, for that question. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't really thought of that. Um, and I should no doubt go back and reread section eight and two, treatise 23 with that question in mind. Uh, my, my sort of preliminary response would be that there are things in section eight which do uh, point toward the principle, particularly paragraph 13 about contrary causes always involving contrary, sorry, sorry contrary effects always involving contrary causes and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. He doesn't state he doesn't state the causal principle straight out. Um, whether it's implied, in a way, I guess I want to say that if I if I follow what you're saying, maybe the arguments for Hume's believing in the causal principle in the way that I'm suggesting uh, might be made stronger by attending to section 10 on miracles. Um, because there, uh, Hume speaks of miracles as absolutely impossible because they contradict the laws of nature. And um, there's a lot in section 10, which I think, which I think uh, and as I say, particularly the beginning and the end, which, which I think supports the idea that Hume, Hume thinks that you really, um, if, you ex if you admit violations of the laws of nature, which he at times speaks of as en bloc, then you, you really overthrow. And I think, uh, I think uh, section 21 or paragraph 21 of, 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 of section four suggests the same thing. You really overthrow the possibility of any knowledge of matters of fact. Now, you know, maybe he's open to that. And there are moments when he seems to be, you know, paragraph 22 in section 12, he says, well, you know, he, he, he advances a Pyrrhonism about that. Um, even though he goes on and then seems to be repudiating it, I, I don't take the repudiation altogether seriously. So I think there's room for that Pyrrhonism. I think at a certain level, Hume doesn't think it can be answered. But then you also have the level of experience. Uh, Yanni Hakarainen, who's here tonight, has tried to distinguish different Humes, and I think that's a promising approach. Yeah, just a, a brief follow-up with respect to, to paragraph 13, because uh, I, I went back and looked at this after you mentioned it in your comments. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think there too, Hume's only relying on the principle that given a certain cause, it necessitates the effect. Um, that's the maxim he claims that philosophers draw at the end of that paragraph. And, and again, that sort of principle is just not the same thing as the principle that everything must have a cause. Thank you very much. I will, I'll think about that. And I would, I would appeal to the latter part, you know, to, to section 10, especially, I think yeah. if we were to continue that, but yeah. yeah thanks, Paul. Great, thanks very much. Um, Tristan, please, do you wanna go ahead? Hello, everyone. Good morning from New Zealand. Uh, um, I'd just like to say, say thanks to Patrick and Michael and also to Bron for writing this book, um, which I'm eagerly awaiting. I have, I've ordered the copy, but I haven't yet received it because of the slowness of the post. So, And I'm even more so um, waiting for it now after hearing all of this uh, information about it today. Um, but I just had a question about... Um, what Michael 
was to what Michael, Patrick, and Brom you raised. Um, so in the um, talking about transcendental idealism, as Brom brought up, and trying to understand this, and also Michael's understanding of the uh, PSR as it is uh, t today, and um, in the critique at uh, at A539 and B567, Kant says that uh, nothing hinders us from ascribing to the transcendental object, apart from the property through which it appears, also another causality that is not appearance, even though its effect is encountered in appearance. Um, I've been trying to make sense of this for quite a while. Um, the idea that there can be some sort of causality out of time. And if that is a lot of um, people that have the analytical um, and type of uh, favor analytical philosophy, they think this idea is quite absurd. Um, so I was just wanting to hear from Brom and, and um, anyone else about this idea that there can be some sort of causality outside of time, which is hard to understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Brom, do you want to respond? Sure. First of all, Tristan, great to meet you. Tristan and I met earlier at a Leuven event uh, or after a Leuven event, and I'm very grateful to meet him. We corresponded some. Um, well, thank you for mentioning that. And uh, well, it may be crazy, but I th certainly think that Kant thinks it. And uh, I myself uh, kind of like the idea. I, um, I don't know how exactly it's related, but I have the, I'm always reminded of what Socrates says in the Phaedo when he's talking about Anaxagoras. And he says, he says uh, uh, you know, there are these people and they would say that the reason I'm in the jail cell now is because of wind currents and, and my sin bones and sinews. And I say, well, uh, but they're kind of missing the point. I'm here because the Athenians condemned me and I decided to stay. And if I had decided differently, these bones and sinews would soon have been in Megara. So um, somehow one has to accommodate these, these different levels. And now, of course, if you thought of the, of the decision that Socrates made simply as a psychological phenomenon, then from Kant's point of view, it would simply be the same sort of causality, just as from Hume's point of view, mental causation is just the same sort of thing as, as physical causation insofar as it concerns phenomena. I'm tempted to go back to Bridger now because various things about Section 8 have been incur occurring to me that might allow me to respond better to what he said, but we'll save that for later. Um, so thank you, Tristan. Sure, that's, that's important here because a big part of the interruption of dogmatic slumber business is the making room for faith and in general, the making room for the, the thinking of noumenal causality, both by God and by souls. And uh, I do think that Kant, that Kant, you might say, was helped in that direction by Hume. And I think one can already begin to see that even in the dreams of a spirit seer in Kant's, you know, among Kant's early writings. So, uh, yeah. Is it, Tristan, do you want to respond to that? Uh, no, that was great. That's um, uh, definitely. And I just wanted to also say I really like the idea um, that Kant is uh, not an outright opponent of Hume. I think that explains a lot about uh, the respect we see for, for Hume throughout Kant's work. So I just had that written down. That was another comment I wanted to make. And I look forward to reading the book. And uh, thanks for letting me know about this talk. And thanks, Patrick, for organizing it. All right. Thanks a lot, Tristan. Um, Michael, did you want to respond to that at all, or do you have any thoughts on that issue? No, I just think it's clear that Kant thinks it is thinkable that there's a causation outside of time. Uh, I don't know if Hume would allow that, um, because Hume seems to think that causes and effects must be c contiguous both in space and time. He gives up the spatial requirement, but I don't think he ever gives up the temporal requirement. Um, but it's clear that, that Kant is allowing for that possibility to be thinkable, and that's really important for him. Um, Right. I quite I quite agree about Hume, Michael. I, when I say that that Hume kind of opened Kant's way toward that, I don't mean that Hume himself embraced anything oh. like that. But I, all I mean is that Hume's 
that Kant saw Hume's rejection of the rationalist causal principle as making room for it. Yeah. I mean, for example, when Hume says, uh, he's talking, he says, after talking about, he says, for he, the, the impious principle of the ancients, ex nihilo nihil fit, by which the creation of matter was excluded, ceases to be a principle on this philosophy. For ought we know a priori, the least, uh, not, not just God, but any cause, the most frivolous might have created matter. Um, and I think that that means, in part, that for ought we know a priori, sure, there could be divine creation or any damn thing you can imagine. So in that sense, at the a priori level, Hume does make sense, room for it. Uh, he, he doesn't think we could ever know it. We can't really maybe conceive it, whether he, whether Hume in a certain sense implicitly thinks we can think it is another question. I, Hume does say anything may cause anything um, at that point. Um, yeah, for ought we know a priori. Yeah. That's strongly qualified by what he says in paragraph 29 just above, where he says that we it's only from experience that we learn the bounds and uh, nature of cause and effect. Good, excellent. Um, who have we got next? Uh, Corinne, please, do you want to go ahead? Welcome. Yes, uh, thanks. And um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, Abram, uh, again, congratulations on your book. Uh, I very much enjoyed also the discussion. And uh, I have uh, one question uh, related to the first part of your uh, in introductory remarks. Um, I think you... Um, uh, claim that that Kant starts to doubt the validity of the PSR uh, because he realized that the principle itself cannot be known through a reason. But then um, later on, you um, focused more on the problem of the uh, dogmatic use of the principle. So there are maybe these two aspects, the question whether the principle itself can be known or uh, what is the justified uh, use of the principle. And um, I personally think that for Kant, the second question is much more relevant, namely the question, at least in the critique pure reason, namely the question uh, under which conditions can the, a principle be used, right? And the, but this other point, whether the principle itself can be known for me, it is not really clear that this was really at issue uh, for Kant and also not uh, for you. Yes, so I would rather see the two of them uh, focusing on, on this other question, namely, um, to what extent can the principle uh, actually be used? Yes, so my question is basically, well, what does it mean to, to know a principle? Does it mean to, um, to, to demonstrate the unconditioned validity of it, or is there something else um, that can be said about the principle itself apart from the question, uh, well, what does it mean to actually use the principle? Yes, and I, I also think that Hume, uh, with regard to causality, is very much interested in the question, well, what does it actually mean to um, uh, conceive of two events as causally related? Yeah, so he's not that much interested in the question, well, what does it mean to, to know uh, the principle itself? At least that's, that would be my suggestion. Thank you very much, Karin. Um, and uh, one of the embarrassments of my book was that it was only after it came out that I discovered that Karin had already published an article in which she said that, uh, that especially important to, uh, about Hume for Kant was, his uh, denial that we could prove the existence of God as a cause. Um, but you're quite right that in the critique, uh, Kant often talks as if what we're, simply, what we're in question was simply how far we extend the principle. And he doesn't spend a lot of time distinguishing two different meanings of the term principle of sufficient reason. But he does on a few occasions talk about people who attempted to demonstrate the principle from pure concepts. And he does that also in the prolegomena talking about Wolf and Baumgarten. Um, and the principle that he has in mind there, I think this corresponds to his description of what it was that Hume demonstrated. 
at the beginning of his description of Hume's attack on metaphysics in, on, on page 257 in the preface, he says, roughly speaking, um, Hume demonstrated incontrovertibly that no one can know from the existence of one thing through pure concepts a priori that something else necessarily also exists. And I think it's quite important that he there talks about things and not events. And the co corresponding passage in the inquiry is paragraph 13, as, as Yanni once pointed out to me, in fact, um, where Hume says, says something quite close to that, that from the idea of one object, doesn't say event, from the idea of one object, we can't, uh, I forget exactly what Hume says, but we can't, we can't conclude to the existence of any other. Um, and the reason, one reason I think it's, this is important is that Kant uh, describes Hume's, Hume's treatment of cause in the prolegomena uh, beginning from the statement that no event in the history of metaphysics has ever been as important as the attack that Hume made on it. And then the whole book is about that. You might say uh, it's all about the question of whether metaphysics is possible as a science and how it's possible as a science. And in order for metaphysics to be possible as a science, uh, we would have to, it, at least speculative metaphysics of the kind that Kant is rejecting, uh, we would have to be able to have a kind, the same kind of principle of sufficient reason that Kant's predecessors thought they had, I think. I think Kant thought that. And I think he thought Hume had demonstrated that we're not entitled to that sort of principle. Um, it's a, I mean, the, you're pointing to a real problem, which I tried to point to briefly, and I certainly tried to deal with in the book, but it's, it, it is very tricky because, because Kant often, in the critique, when he uses the expression principles, fish, and reason, he mostly means simply, uh, maybe, maybe you could argue that he always means the principle that every event has a cause, although he sometimes speaks about attempts to demonstrate it uh, a priori. And, you know, he talks about the principles of fish and reason in different ways in different places. Um, in the, uh, I forget whether it's in On a Discovery or in the Progress of Metaphysics, he talks about it in another way that's very interesting about what Leibniz meant by it. And there's a whole, there are many, many things one could say about that. But, but I, just, I just can't make sense of what he's doing when he describes Hume's treatment of the principle um, is demonstration that no one can know from this that uh, in the context of an attack on metaphysics without without reading it in the way I've proposed. Now you could you could argue that well he doesn't talk about a principle there Kant. You could argue and people have often read his remark in this very way that all he's talking about is particular relations between objects. Um, and my answer to that would simply be that, first of all, if you exclude that kind of particular relation between objects, you are by implication excluding what I'm calling the rationalist principle of sufficient reason. Because uh, if, you, if you can't have such knowledge, that means you don't, we're not entitled to that principle. But also that, uh, in fact, both Kant's phrasing and Hume's phrasing do um, can be understood as ex excluding the principle that there's nothing without without a cause. Nothing there can't be any anything without without something else which which causes or explains it or or is its own cause. Um, so you're raising a, a huge and very important question, Karin, and I would love to discuss it further. Um, uh, but that I guess is how I would try to answer. Okay, thank you. Excellent, great, thanks a lot. Um, Dina Elmahandis, would you like to go ahead? Um, you're currently still muted if you're trying to speak. Oh, there we go. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, all good, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I, I want first to con congratulate the Dr. Anderson for his book. Congratulations, Dr. Anderson. And, uh, and the subject is very important that uh, causal connections are not necessary. And uh, I wanted to know, Yanni, about other philosophers 
are there other philosophers who talked about the, this same important subject? I know about uh, one philosopher, Al-Ghazali, in the 11th uh, century. He talked about, uh, yeah, yes, this same thing, that uh, causal connections, as we know them now, yani, they are not necessary. Are there other philosophers who talked about the same subject? Well, sure. I mean, actually, on my reading, neither Kant nor Hume agrees with that. But I, there were other thinkers who did, uh, at least, well, uh, maybe in the same sense that, uh, that Ghazali did. That is, um, I think Malbranche, for example, thought that the connection between one event and another event was not a necessary connection, although he also thought that all causal relations are necessitated by God. So there's another sense in which he did think that the relation was necessary. Um, but yes, uh, that, uh, that um, question that Ghazali raises is a, it certainly had a big, big career uh, in, in early modern Western metaphysics, you know, European metaphysics as well. And uh, so that's something that uh, is very much worth following up. Thanks a lot, Dr. Anderson. Sure, thank you, Dina. Thanks a lot. I mean, yeah, just on that point, it's, it's quite fascinating, fascinating. And, and, you know, sometimes when I teach him, I do think about this connection. Uh, and, and far as I'm aware, he, he was, Hume was not um, informed about or read Al-Ghazali, but there's, there's sometimes you see this connection brought up where Al-Ghazali is a kind of occasionalist, right? So he kind of thinks that there's perhaps no necessary connection, but that's God doing all of these connections in this way, right? Um, so I, I don't know if that would make him, yeah, I'm not sure if that would be the same kind of necessity um, that you've been dwelling on here, Brom, I'm not sure. But just, to, just as an interesting point, I think that's a really good question. And I wouldn't be well placed to, to, to make, an, make a comment on any, about whether there's much literature on, on comparing these. I'm sure there is, um, but that would certainly be very interesting to see just what the, um, just what the links are, uh, just what the, the, the similarities are between uh, Al-Khazali on causation and, and uh, what human can't have to say. Um, right, yeah, so thanks for, your, thanks for your question there, Dina, that's excellent. Do we have any other uh, questions or comments? I, th I saw a few hands go up, uh, but then were lowered. I'm not sure if that was uh, deliberate or they just timed out, but please. Um, uh, yeah, Curtis, please, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, thanks. Uh, congratulations, Brom. I have a, a question that's rather broad in nature, so forgive me. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask about uh, the curious claim that Kant thinks he's making room for faith. And one, one question that that prompts is, uh, just in, in what way does the untamed principle of reason uh, shut the door on faith? And it, it seems to me kind of implicit in your account that there might be two ways that it does that. And one you might understand in terms of efficient causation and the other maybe in final causation. And by efficient, I mean Kant's argument that he wants to make space for noumenal causes. Maybe you would understand that as free action. But I'm wondering whether he's also interested in making space for a sense of final causation. And of course, those are very big topics, but I'm wondering whether uh, you find these two options uh, relevant to the first encounter with Hume, the awakening from dogmatic slumber. Is he more interested in questions of efficient or final causation here? Well, Curtis, your questions are always wonderful. And I feel that there must be, a, there's a lot behind that question that I'm curious about too. I feel like we should have a long conversation about it. I mean, um, I mean, one way to read that remark, which doesn't occur until much later in the preface to the second edition of the critique, is that, that Kant is thinking along the same lines as he does in the critique of practical reason, when he says that transcendental idealism is the only way of avoiding Spinozism. Um, because, and that's a, that remark is, is a provocative one, of course, uh, but if you, accept it, or at least accept that Kant means it, um, 
Well, that you can see why transcendental idealism would be necessary if you wanted to make room for faith, because, because there's no room for faith in Spinoza, at least in the Spinoza of the ethics. Uh, since, uh, I mean, this is certainly the way Jacobi read him, but uh, since everything is, uh, you might say, God is knowable, but there's no room for believing in God except by being ignorant. And by being ignorant, not in, this, in a sort of necessary sense, in the way that Kant is talking about, in a sense in which ignorance can have something rational about it, but simply in the sense of being confused. And Kant doesn't, that's not what Kant is trying to defend. He's not trying to defend the, the right to be confused. He's, uh, he's trying to make room for a kind of faith which, which, is, which is rational, which is not simply a matter of obscure and confused ideas. Now, as to teleological, I do, th I would, that's very interesting, that question about teleology. Um, I mean, I feel like we need to spend time on the critique of teleological judgment, for example, uh, maybe on the dialogues. There's a lot there. Do you want to say something more about that question, Curtis? No, I mean, again, it, it, was, it was too broad. No, uh, it's, it's another... beautiful. I, I mean, I th it's not too broad because I'm sure that there's a lot behind it that's precise, but, but I guess uh, part of making room for faith, well, it does mean making room for the thought of a, and uh, in part, an intelligent, uh, freely acting creator who acts according to ends. So in that sense, it does mean making room for teleology. And it also does, as you were maybe suggesting, it also means making room for belief in the possibility of human freedom as, as a rational freedom in which we act according to ends. So in both those senses, yes. Whether it means making room for Aristotelian teleology is another question and exactly how it fits with what's going on in the critique of teleological judgment is another question still. Uh, but Kant has a very interesting discussion about Hume, Hume's dialogues, which is, of course, an attack on a teleological reading of nature, in which, in the, in the, late in the prolegomena, you know, he devotes two sections of the prolegomena, as, you, as I'm sure you know, to, to arguing against that, that Hume hasn't really destroyed the possibility of a teleological understanding of, of the world. Um, so, yeah, that, that's directed against Hume, though, not against Spinoza. Um, but uh, whereas I think that Hume maybe helps him against Spinoza. Great. Curtis, did you want to follow up on that at all? Or? Uh, no, I'm all set. Thanks, Bram. Great. Uh, Michael, please. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up on what uh, Bram just said about, uh, you know, Kant has a distinction between uh, um, knowledge and faith. We can have knowledge and that makes room for faith. By limiting knowledge, we can make room for faith. Um, and there's nothing comparable in Hume going on, I think, really, because uh, uh, earlier you said that uh, there's room for Pyrrhonism in Hume. I mean, there's lots of ways to interpret Hume on skepticism. And I think I probably have a more skeptical reading of Hume than you do. I'm not, I'm not sure. But there is certainly, it, as you said, there's room for Pyr Pyrrhonist reading of Hume. Um, but I don't think there's room for Pyrrhonism in Kant, right? Uh, we can have, we don't know whether God exists, but we can have faith there. And that's because we have this solid knowledge about which there's no doubt, knowledge of the empirical realm for Kant. So uh, there's no room for Pyrrhonism about our knowledge of um, ordinary events in, in the, the everyday world for Kant. But there is, I think, for Hume. Hume's skepticism can be taken at, in radical or less ra radical varieties. And I think there's just this tension within Hume, but there's no such tension within Kant, I think. I, I don't think that Kant leaves room for Pyrrhonism, but I do think that, that um, Hume does. I don't know what, what you thought of that, Brahm, or whether you think that's correct. Well, you're leading me back to the problem of miracles, Michael. Yes, well, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, I think, on my reading of Kant, um, <clears throat> I think it's very important that Kant uh, and I think he's very close to Hume on miracles, in fact. I think he thinks 
that we can't know that there are no miracles. Mm -hmm. if, we, if there were miracles or if we allow the, that there are or have been miracles, we overthrow the categories. And the only answer to that is through practical reason. Mm -hmm. So you could argue that, I mean, when I say there's room for Pyrrhonism in Hume, part of what I mean is that underneath, it's all Pyrrhonism. <laughs> Everything I was saying about experience and knowledge and all that, that's sort of floating above the Pyrrhonism. Mm -hmm. But whereas, and in Kant, you could argue that, well, it's not that there's Pyrrhonism underneath, but that the fact that, he, that you really, ultimately, you have to rely on practical reason to repel radical, a radical skepticism. Um, it's not so far in some ways from a Peronian perspective. And I think he's very much influenced at an early date by, by Rousseau in this respect, by the profession of faith of Savoyard Victor, Vicar, maybe by, maybe even by the letter to Voltaire, that there's a kind of, there's a fideist inspiration. And that uh, is not just for defending God, it, because in the end, um, you got two problems. One is to save room for God, and the other is to control miracles. And this is, <laughs> the problem of controlling miracles is especially a problem for Kant, precisely because he agrees with Hume that we're not entitled to the principle of sufficient reason in the sort of radical sense. Spinoza can just blow them off because they're inconceivable. Um, although Spinoza in the theological political treatise um, himself makes room for faith. In some ways, the model of making room for faith that you have in Kant descends through Rousseau from the theological political treatise, I think, where, however, Spinoza advances it as a necessary, useful fiction. You know, that is the, the belief in a divine judge and individual immortality and, and, and freedom in chapter 14. Uh, the legislator is entitled, the sovereign is entitled to demand that people assent to those things. They're all false, but they may be necessary for civil order. Now, that's not what Kant wants to say. And yet Kant's position, Kant's, Kant is trying to save room for those things without treating them as false. And I think in that respect, he's following uh, an opening suggested by Rousseau and maybe by Bale. And in a way, all of this helps to see Kant's relation to Hume better because uh, it's very important on my understanding of Kant that he, like Hume, is in many ways a disciple of Bale. And of course, he, he's neither as rationalistic nor as skeptical as Bale in many important ways. But uh, that's, what, that's actually one of the sections of the book that I'd be grateful to have people respond to is my, is my attempt to show that Kant's, Kant's uh, that what Kant means by the objection of David Hume when he speaks of that, he's referring above all, there are a couple of paragraphs in the inquiry, especially 413, which Yanni pointed me to, but also 1229, note D uh, in the buckle edition about the impious maxim of the ancients. Um, one of the weird things about that footnote is uh, that uh, it appears to be directed against rational theology. So what's he, why is he talking about the ancients and the exclusion of matter? Isn't he just talking about Lucretius? Um, but I was happy years ago to discover a passage in Bale's article Spinoza in which Bale explains that Spinoza was uh, precipitated over the precipice, or he, he, he fell over the precipice because of uh, a principle of the ancients, that nothing comes from nothing. And I think that's the passage that Hume is trying to evoke in that footnote. And I, I think Kant knew Bale's article very well. There's evidence of that, and that, that so that he would have recognized that, that reference. So you have a whole kind of uh, background context there, which is which is part of what I find uh, interesting about this whole thing. It may be that, that Hume knew Spinoza through that article by Bale more than directly encountering Spinoza. I think that's probably true, but, uh, but I think that Bale's article, 
is, uh, you know, Bale is a tricky writer and it's easy sometimes to dismiss, you know, sometimes people dismiss him because he, he, he's playful and he seems inconsistent. But I think both Hume and Kant were capable of working their way past uh, some of the, the playful aspects of Bale and, and getting at what he was actually delivering. I think it was also Kant's chief source for the knowledge of Bale, sorry, of, of Spinoza. Um, so, yeah. For that matter, it was very important to Jacobi, although Jacobi certainly did know the ethics directly. Good. Uh, just, just kind of on that, Brahma, just a, just a very minor, maybe too general point. Uh, but um, I find the, the placement of Spinoza in the story really interesting because, um, okay, here we've got someone who, you know, uh, makes use of the PSR in this unrestricted fashion, right? Through and through, we can, have, you know, understand, understand, at least in principle, understand what's going on. Uh, and in some sense, of course, uh, he's got to be a target, right? He's got to be one of the targets that, that Kant has in mind and, and, and later Neo-Kantians have in, have in mind. Um, um, but at the same time, uh, there's some quite interesting parallels here, uh, some of which you've touched on before. Um, and maybe this comes back on to what Curtis was talking about with, with the teleology, but of course, um, well, Spinoza has no, no time for that. Um, although he has, has perhaps a different critique of, of teleology than Kant. Um, I, had a, I was just kind of interested about what you think the parallels there might be. Uh, I thought you might have, might have raised this um, in response to Curtis, but just out of curiosity, uh, on the one hand, Spinoza seems to be an opponent through his use, his deployment of the PSR, but is there a, or to what extent um, do you think that his claims about, or his critique of teleology um, could have had a, a, a pretty lasting influence on, on the Kantian uh, position. Well, I do think, and here I'm following uh, uh, a, a student of, 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 of Michael's and Ken's, Omri Berm, I do think that Spinoza was extremely important to Kant. And um, I think that, I mean, I, you know, Kant's critique of, and I think, he's, I think on the whole he was resisting him, but I think he took him very seriously. That's not always clear from his references to Spinoza. It's certainly clear in the Critique of Practical Reason, but I think, I think he was engaging with him a long, a long time before that. Um, I disagree with Henri, who thinks that Kant was a Spinozist in the Beweiskund, in his early writing on, on theology. But I do think he was paying a lot of attention to Spinoza already at that time. But it's curious. I mean, I think that actually the discussion of teleology and the critique of teleological judgment is one of the places where Kant looks closest to Spinoza to me. Uh, because there he seems to say, well, you know, a being with intellectual intuition, i.e. God, wouldn't wouldn't, uh, for such a being, there wouldn't be teleology. There's no distinction between possibility and actuality and necessity. So there's not really room for teleology for God. Uh, so in a certain sense, it makes him seem very Spinozist that, that teleology is only possible for us because of the limitations of our minds. Um, that's an interesting challenge. I think there have been some, there's some recent interesting work on Kant's, uh, the development of Kant's thought on modality, which has tried to to, to tackle that challenge directly by Abachi and Stang, I think, and some others. I haven't studied it as closely as I should, but. Uh. Yeah, but I mean, that's what I'm kind of, um, the reason I was asking is I think I have the same, maybe the same intuitions as you here. And I'm just trying to think of, okay, so Spinoza, one interpretation of this general story is that we tend to think of things in a, or some things in a teleological fashion, precisely because of our limitations. We have experiences of how we act for ends, and we, in a way, perhaps project that into into nature. And that's where we're kind of mistaken about um, um, the reasons why things happen. Um, and so he, he has a kind of, or at least I have interpreted him as a kind of having a debunking explanation of these these uh, teleological, particularly when deployed by religious authorities, teleological explanations of things. Um, 
And I kind of see that I, I can't quite decide whether I don't know enough about it to say whether Kant reads that or an account of that and says, okay, this is interesting. This is going to inform my views that he, he sets out uh, in the critique of, critique of judgment. Um, and this is informing his own view that there's a kind of, you know, our minds are bringing something to the table in some respect when we're, when we're talking about ends and final causes. Um, and I don't know if this is just a, if this is a direct relation that he's inspired by Spinoza here, or if this is some kind of, um, maybe a coincidence is not the right word, but some something, but it's not ne necessarily coming from Spinoza. I'm not quite sure on that. And I'm sure Michael has something to say uh, maybe about that and, or, or maybe he has a different view. I mean, Michael, did you? Well, I you just, I think that um, Spinoza denied the distinction between theoretical and practical reasoning. And that's connected with Spinoza's denial of teleology, uh, all teleology. Um, Kant really wants to um, have a distinction between theoretical and practical reasoning. And that's connected with Kant's wanting to preserve a role for teleology. So he, um, I think Omri showed very well that <clears throat> Kant knew what was going on in Spinoza and knew he had to avoid Spinoza on both grounds, on the denial of teleology, he had to avoid that. And Kant also had to avoid Spinoza's elimination of the distinction between theoretical and practical reasoning. And thus, Kant opened up a kind of freedom that you don't get in, in Spinoza. I think that's, uh, that's very, all those points go together. Right, okay, excellent. Um, I, I think I saw uh, a hand go up. Maybe that was on this point. Did anyone else want to jump in here? <clears throat> uh, 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 Bridger, yes. Yeah, I, I have a, I mean, it, I guess it's, it's more unrelated now than it was five minutes ago. Um, but uh, uh, I was I was wondering, Brahm, about a, a claim you make with regard to Hume and, and God considered as a cause of the world uh, in, in your book. Um, so you, you point out that on Hume's view, there's no good causal argument for the existence of God. And, and that certainly seems right. But you also make the further claim and describe it as Hume's more radical claim that God can't be conceived of the cause of the, as the cause of the world on Hume's view. And I, I was just wondering about you, the reasons you, you give for that in your book. So it seems to me that the, the interpretive claim centers on your conceiving of God for Hume as an extra experiential being. Um, and since the concept of cause can't be applied beyond experience on Hume's view, we can't apply the concept of cause to God. Um, but I, I was wondering about inquiry two, where Hume seems to suggest that we have an idea of God, one formed in the sort of Lockean way where we amplify our own cognitive capacities. So given that Hume seems to acknowledge that we have an idea of God, I was wondering why that idea wouldn't be sufficient for getting a constant conjunction going, at least an imaginary constant conjunction, such that we could conceive of God, the object of that idea, as being the cause of the world. Well, I mean, Kant makes a remark in the natural history of religion that, uh, that the gods of paganism are not unsupported by arguments from probability because they closely resemble beings with which we are acquainted. So uh, the only argument against them as concerns our world is that we have no actual experience of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, in order to have a constant conjunction you would have to have a couple of things. You'd have to have um, a bunch of worlds being caused by uh, a bunch of creators, you know, each world at least with at least one creator. And so that you could discern the causal relation. Now, the argument that I think I had in mind when, when I said that Kant says that we can't conceive God as cause of the world was the argument in the last paragraph, section 11, where he, he, he says not just we can't, um, it's a very sort of subtle uh, little remark. I don't know if I should read it out loud, but I'm sure you know it, Bridger, but others may not. He says, um, let's see. But there occurs to me, continued I, with regard to your main topic, a difficulty which I shall just propose to you without insisting on it lest it lead into reasonings too, of too nice and delicate a nature. Nice meaning touchy. In a word, I much doubt whether it be possible for a cause to be known only, known only by its effect, as you have all along supposed, 
or to be of so singular and particular a nature as to have no parallel and no similarity with any other cause or object that has ever fallen under our observation. It is only when two species of objects are found to be constantly conjoined that we can infer the one from the other and were in effect presented, which was entirely singular, we could not be it, it could not be comprehended under any known species, I do not see that we could form any conjec conjecture or inference at all concerning its cause. If experience and observation analogy be indeed the only guides which we can reasonably follow in inferences of this nature, both the effect and the cause must have similarity, bear a similarity and resemblance to other effects and causes which we know and which we have found in many instances to be conjoined with each other. I leave it to your reflection to pursue the consequences of this principle. I shall just observe that as the antagonists of Epicurus always suppose the universe an effect quite singular and unparalleled to be the proof of a deity, a cause no less singular and unparalleled, your reasonings upon that supposition seem at least to merit our attention. There is, I own, some difficulty how we can ever return from the cause to the effect and reasoning from our ideas of the former infer any alteration in the latter or any addition to it. I mean, so, I mean, part of the problem is lack of experience. Part of the problem is uniqueness. That is to say, we, we, it seems as if we can't actually conceive any cause of a unique effect or any effect of a unique cause, which by the way, is an additional problem for miracles, of course. Um, and this seems to, you know, this is related to the idea that there, nothing can happen except under laws of nature. Um, and to some of the further reasons I have for wanting to say that section eight also implies the causal principle, but yeah. Yeah, so I guess I'm wondering, so that, that seems to work with respect to if you try to slot in God himself as the kind of unique cause, um, but what about God's volitions, um, which it seems like Hume should allow that we also have ideas of, given that the idea of God is formed partially by amplifying our own capacities, one of which is the capacity for having volitions. If you have that sort of view, then it seems like there's no bar to conceiving of God's volitions as being constantly content, um, attended with the um, effects that are willed. Um, so, so there, again, that's not a, an argument for God on the basis of causation. It's just a way in which to conceive God as being the, a cause. Well, that's, it's all, that's very interesting. I mean, certainly, you know, in the natural history of religion, he talks a lot about how you get the concept of God, not just the gods of paganism, but how you get the, the, the notion of the, the theistic God. Mm -hmm. And according to him, there seem to be two ways to get that notion, according to the natural history of religion. One is through the intervention of priests who keep magnifying our ideas of God, at least verbally, in order to, in order to humble everyone else and impress everyone and, uh, and cause everyone to fear to contradict them uh, and to admit, admit things that other people, nobody really understands. Maybe the priests claim to understand it, but uh, so I think that, I don't know whether Kant would say that the idea of God, the, the, uh, 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 of the deity that, that the priests generate, it may be too incoherent for anyone actually to be able to conceive it. On the other hand, he also speaks of God as a, you know, a sort of singular cause of the order of nature and says that it's, it's natural to suppose that there is such a cause. And, uh, I think, I think you can make a case that he, he, he talks about there being moral effects of the belief of theism, meaning monotheism. Uh, that which is connected with popular religion, I think, has moral effects which are, which are uh, uniformly bad, in his view. That is, it, it uh, maybe not uniformly, but largely bad, that they, they, they sort of uh, crush us and terrify us and lower our idea of human nature in all sorts of unfortunate ways. But I think there might be an argument, and I've actually tried to make it, that he, he holds a similar view even about what you might call the god of science, that, that a scientific theism like that of the Newtonians might also be harmful by making us think that there is this single immense cause that, that surpasses 
uh, what we can really conceive. There's something crushing even about that conception of a single cause. It, 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 it shatters the human perspective in a way that he thinks is, is dangerous. Um, and some of it, you know, there's those remarks he makes about the, the comparing the Newtonians to uh, uh, people engaging in priestcraft. Um, uh, that, uh, so I think, you know, but in order, you might say, you might argue that in order for those ideas to have bad effects on us, we must have to be able to conceive something or at least imagine something. And that's sort of, that's an interesting question. That is, I think the argument at the end of section 11, he's talking about God understood as an actual cause that we could actually conceive according to our actual ways of causal reasoning. In some of these other places, um, he's talking about giant phantoms uh, but the, I admit the problem, the problem with respect to the singular cause that's, that's supposed to be the organizing principle of nature in the natural history of religion is somewhat different. And I'm not sure I've thought it through enough. I'd, I'd welcome further discussion of this, Bridger. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to me that the issue will turn on whether conceiving of something as a cause requires that there be reasonable basis for a causal inference um, with the, the Rolada in, in, involved. And if you think that latter claim is right, uh, then 1130 um, of, of the inquiry would seem to me to show that we can't even form the idea of God as cause. Um, right, and if the, idea, if the idea of cause is the idea of constant conjunction, mm -hmm. I, think, I think 1130 relies directly on, on those paragraphs in the second part of section seven, where he's arguing that the idea of that our only idea of necessary connection is the idea of constant conjunction. Yeah. But... Hi, Yanni. Um, I just, before I want to come to, to Yanni, uh, there's one other question from Wolfgang. Uh, if you would please want to go ahead and then we'll come to Yanni afterwards. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to uh, congratulate Brom on his book. It's, I think it's a wonderful effort. Um, and I'm happy to, meet you here in yeah, quasi person <laughs> for the first time. Now my um, question is a comment. I was impressed. So I, I like the coherence of your book and the way you tell a story which really um, connects many things. But I, uh, basically I find you make the story too complicated it's much simpler. And my impression is that in one crucial point, you uh, take the effect for the cause. Uh, let me uh, explain what I have in mind. <clears throat> well, I believe that uh, the basic point of discussion between Hume and Kant is more of a logical nature. And the basic issue Kant saw in Hume was the distinction between matters of fact and relations of ideas in the inquiry. And I think that if you have this distinction, if you accept this distinction as mutually exclusive, then, and then you ask, what about the uh, principle of sufficient reason? Then you find there's no more room for, the, for such a principle. It just doesn't fit in. So you have the effect. If you have the, this distinction as a cause, so to speak, you have the effect that the principle of sufficient reason makes no sense whatsoever. So you don't have to attack it. It just drops away. And one um, effect of putting things in your way, and which I was really curious about, is the very low status you uh, you give to the distinction between analytic and synthetic judgments in Kant. Because I believe this comes along with the matters of fact and relations of ideas distinction. So, but you really can't make much of that <laughs> because they're interested in the effect and not in the cause in this, in this way. And I will try to tell the same story in a simpler way, but that'll be a different book. Thank you.
Well, Wolfgang, it is great to meet you, so to speak, in person. Wolfgang and I have been corresponding for many years through our mutual friend, initially through our friend uh, Hanno Birkenberch, and then also directly as well as. And Wolfgang has a wonderful article, which he published in 2012, on the problem of the awakening uh, through Hume, and uh, which I find, uh, which I admire very much. And I think that your suggestion, Wolfgang, it's extremely attractive. It does many nice things. I mean, one of them is you really do link up the account of the interruption of dogmatic slumber with the genesis of the distinction between synthetic and analytic judgments, which is, of course, crucial. Um, and moreover, another thing I like about your suggestion, that is Wolfgang, basically, if I can try summing it up, is that, is that what really mattered to Kant from Hume is Hume saying, well, we can't know matters of fact through relations of ideas, i.e. in particular, the principle of contradiction doesn't allow us to know any matters of fact. And so that is central in Hume. And one thing I like about uh, the way Wolfgang draws attention to it is it also helps us to see how, um, see the importance of Kant's critique of the ontological proof for the development of the critique. And that, that criticism of the ontological proof is already present in Kant's Beweiskund, which is published at the end of 1762, as Wolfgang has, has noticed. And I think it's, it's, it's he, the emphasis he's putting on this is very important. And I, I sometimes feel, well, is Wolfgang right? Am I going off the rails with all this PSR stuff? I guess I have a couple of reasons for thinking that it's nevertheless uh, uh, worthwhile to approach things in the way I'm doing. And one of them is that I think that Kant started to see all this before he, some years before he arrived at the distinction between analytic and synthetic judgments. And um, that it really did have to do with Hume's attack on metaphysics, which uh, it, you're quite right uh, that you've, you've argued that, it, that that has to do with the distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact, and you're quite right about that. Um, and I think that is visible in the rejection of the ontological proof in the Beweiskund, for example. Um, but when Kant is describing uh, Hume's attack on metaphysics in the Prolegomena, and when he talks about Hume elsewhere, he, of course, he talks a lot about cause. And I wanted to be able to explain how that fitted into the story. And you could say, well, it can all be understood in terms of that distinction between relations of ideas and, and uh, um, matters of fact. And perhaps that's right. Um, certainly it's, it's deeply connected with that. The other, one other reason that, that makes me think I'm not completely off, well, two reasons. One reason is the antinomy. And I think that the principle of sufficient reason does supply an important link with the problem of the antinomy, um, because that's that's not really about the distinction between matters of fact and relations of ideas, or at least it's not. I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's not in any way involved, but I don't think it's so easily graspable through that as when you think about the PSR. Another another point, though, is the importance of the concept of cause for Kant and the possibility of of uh, Kant says that Hume's question was not whether the, uh, the concept of cause was correct, usable, and indispensable for the whole knowledge of nature, but whether it had an origin in reason and might therefore possibly be applicable to objects beyond experience. And I think it was terribly important to Kant. This is, and I think this is the, the reason for the transcendental deduction, but also even the, the transcendental aesthetic to defend the possibility of what he calls the pure elements of human cognition. You yourself have pointed to our, uh, section 39 of the prolegomena as a clue to Kant's development, and I'm thinking of that. But also, this is the root of the deduction, as I say. He wants to defend the possibility of thinking a thing which, um, uh, by means of the pure category. And the, the whole, that whole problem, I think, uh, is not quite so easy to capture if we just focus on the distinction between matters of fact and relations of ideas. Um, although I, I repeat, I think your, 
I, I mean, I welcome your calling me to account and forcing me to think hard about whether I need to talk about the PSR. Um, I think it's an important question. Um, can I just follow up uh, one another question? Uh, now, please. you just mentioned the notion of a cause. Mm -hmm. And well, it seems to me that the kind of notion of a cause that Hume was attacking was not uh, attempts to try to give a causal proof of the existence of God, for instance, but to make sense of simple causes in everyday, everyday life, so to speak the mundane notion of a cause. So we can't make sense of what a cause is if you have this um, distinction between matters of fact, where we have just matters of fact, but no connection between them. And we have relations of ideas, but they don't help in understanding what a cause, what a cause really may, should be. And so it's, it seems natural that Kant would point out, well, Hume made it, yeah, made it explicit that we have in the middle of every day, everything we are thinking about, something we simply don't understand. And we don't even have to go to theology. That's, that'll be a very different story. So. Well, I think your view of Hume's priorities, uh, Wolfgang, is it's, it's very close to what, what I think has been the, the standard view. It's very close to the way Michael Friedman sees things or or uh, Michael Forster, or you know, many other people going back uh, to to Weihinger and, and 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 no doubt before, and uh, so I respect it since if so many people think that this is what Hume was really concerned with, and what uh, if we're, and Kant was really concerned with too. Well, I mean, one has to respect the consensus gentium, but uh, I. I guess I think that if one, then if one follows that track, then one can't, one can't understand what Kant means when he says that what Hume's question was, was whether the concept of cause had its origin in reason and might therefore perhaps be applicable to objects beyond experience, nor can one understand what Kant means, for example, in the preface to the Critique of Practical Reason in a passage that is very important to Richard Fincham, who I regret couldn't be with us tonight. Um, because I've had many wonderful conversations with him in which Kant says on page 13 in the Academy that uh, he's talking about how Hume would have, would have been very happy with a certain kind of empiricism because he said, Hume wished to deny reason all judgment with regard to God, freedom, and immortality. And th this is in the background of his later discussion of the, the, the categories and Hume in the section on the right of reason to an extension in its practical use to which it's not entitled and it's speculative. Um, it seems to me there the focus is indisputably on that use beyond experience and Kant thinks, I think it, it's clear that Kant thinks that that's what really mattered to Hume too. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that in addition to Michael the world also contains a man I've never met, Paul Russell, who's published this book in 2008 on the riddle of uh, Hume's treatise, in which he makes the case that even in the treatise, which is far more visibly, less visibly anti-theological than the inquiry, it's all about theology. So I, I feel tempted to throw the ball to Russell, who's not here to pick it up. Um, Excellent. Thank you. And thanks, Wolfgang, for your, for your question. Um, I think we've got time for one more. So, uh, Yanni, please uh, go ahead. Thanks, Patrick. And uh, congratulations from, for the book. I haven't got a copy yet, but, uh, but I will order one very soon. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, and, and also thanks for, for Michael and Patrick for very insightful comments and, uh, and for everybody, everyone in the discussion, this has been very, very, very interesting, a very good uh, way to end this work day because we are here in Finland, the clock is almost uh, nine o'clock PM to Okay, and, 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 and this, all this really um, takes me back to, back to the 
good old days in 2008 and 2009 at your and your mother's flat where we had long long nights discussing uh, mainly cause the cause of real reading of Hume uh, over over some whiskey and uh, I have of course great very fond memories of, of, of that but uh, let me ask a question to I, I haven't got the book, but uh, I was just thinking whether, whether you discussed the issue that, uh, of course, Hume's, um, I would say the only proper discussion of the causal maxim is actually in the treatise, treatise 133. And uh, whether you discuss the fact, as far as I know, that Kant didn't read the treatise, because it hadn't been translated into German during his lifetime, actually. And and he couldn't read English, as far as I know. Yes, thank you, Yanni. Uh, Yanni does play a very important role in the origins of this book, too. Uh, and those those uh, evenings with whiskey were, were very important for it. Uh, he also plays an important role in drawing my attention to the existence of Yale, including both uh, Michael and Omri, um, but, uh, yes, uh, actually I have a chapter in which I allow myself to discuss Treatise 133, um, as collateral evidence for my reading of the inquiry and also to discuss a letter from a gentleman and, and, uh, various other pieces of evidence. Um, now the idea, the problem of whether Kant knew the treatise and there, whether he could therefore have known treatise 133 has been a central topic of discussion in the history of this problem of how Kant woke Hume because precisely because it was argued by Weihinger and Erdmann and accepted by Kemp Smith and many others that, well, in order for Hume to have woken Kant from dogmatic slumber, the only way for him to have done it would have been to have challenged the principle that every event has a cause, because I think they took it as obvious that that uh, that's where Kant got the notion of synthetic judgments a priori through having to defend that principle, which is the central, you know, he says is the central problem of the critique, how are they possible? And it's also the focus of the second analogy, which is Kant's most highly elaborated response to human cause in the, uh, in the critique, unless you count the deduction. Um, so the question of how Kant could have known it, they, they wanted to say, well, he must have known about it, even though he didn't uh, read English and it wasn't translated until 1790 and so on. Um, and the solution that they came up with was that, well, he had in fact encountered uh, a report of Hume's treatment of, of the causal principle in Beatty's essay on truth, which was published in 1770, but published in German in 1772. And on the one hand, I've been, I, I you know, in the introduction to this book and, and uh, elsewhere, I've, I've wanted to argue against the Kemp Smith, Weinger, Erdmann understanding of how Hume interrupted Kant's dogmatic slumber. I wanted to say, well, it wasn't by an encounter with Treatise 133. Um, but, uh, and I think it wasn't, I think it happened, I think the event that Kant is talking about happened in the late, as Wolfgang does, in the late 1750s, beginning of the 1760s. However, I do think, I move to this by a passage in, in the Antinomy in particular, um, but some things in the Prolegomena too, I do think that Kant uh, was aware of Beatty's book and that he was aware of you know, Beatty's report of Treatise 133. Um, and I think that Kant would simply have read that against the background of his own understanding of inquiry 12, 1229 note D, because when Beatty, and this is something that Kemp Smith, and as far as I remember, Weihinger don't really pay any attention to, because when Beatty reports uh, what Hume is doing in Treatise 133, he makes it very clear, as Hume's contemporaries did, 
And Hume himself certainly acknowledges this in a letter from a gentleman that what's at issue is theology. You know, Hume, Hume it was attacked in the pamphlet to which he responds in the letter from a gentleman uh, for attacking the causal principle as a way of promoting atheism. And Beatty, Beatty is, Beatty's discussion of Treatise 133 is certainly in the spirit of that attack. Beatty, Beatty wants to defend the possibility of proving the causal principle against Hume because he wants to defend the possibility of proving the existence of God. And then another, he also talks about inquiry 1130. I mean, he doesn't use those paragraph numbers, of course, but about Hume's argument against the possibility of conceiving a unique cause, um, and which is crucial, I think, for Kant as well. I think that's what Kant is above all thinking about when he talks about Hume's question in the preface of the Prolegomena. It was that very, uh, that very passage which Bridger was, was asking about. Um, and uh, Kant shows that he's aware of Beatty, not just by talking about Beatty in the Prolegomena, as he does, and attacking Beatty's way of handling Hume, but more specifically, there's a passage in the Antinomy itself. I don't think I talk about this in the book, but uh, there's a passage in the Antinomy where he's contrasting the way uh, the, common the, 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 the common human understanding understand, looks at things and the way the philosopher does. And I think his way of talking about the common human understanding, he says it demands something it can begin from. And I think he's there simply talking about Beatty's response to Kant in Beatty, as to Hume in Beatty's, and on the causal principle in Beatty's essay on truth. But he also says the common human understanding doesn't even know what it is to conceive something. And there I think he's talking about Beatty's Beatty's attack on Hume's argument against the possibility of conceiving a unique cause. So I think Kant did in fact pay attention to Beatty's book, although that wasn't what first interrupted his dogmatic slumber. And although in order to understand what it meant to him, one has to pay attention to the whole theological dimension, which was crucial for Beatty. And, uh, you know, as I want to argue for, not just for Hume, but for all the, uh, you know, the, the generally the reception of Hume. Russell is, Paul Russell is very good on, on that question too, on, on how in general the treatise was received in those days. Excellent, thanks very much uh, for a nice comprehensive uh, answer there. Um, Sorry if I went on too long. <laughs> no, that's not what I was implying, no, it was very important. <laughs> I didn't know about this, too much about this BT connection. So that's, that's really, uh, really interesting to hear. Um, we will have to leave it there because we're out of time, but I just want to thank everyone for attending. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. I want to thank again, uh, Michael De La Roca for giving us his time for, and, and, and comments on the book. And of course, our biggest thanks to Brom for writing this book in the first place. Um, you know, sincere thanks to that and congratulations to him. So, um, yeah. Thanks and if anybody, much. if anybody wants to stay on, since I'm a co-host, just to say hi afterwards, uh, I'll stick around for a little bit. Perfect. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Thanks, everyone. And have a good rest of your evening or rest of your day, depending on where you are. Thanks again.